Now we're going to read from the scriptures this morning. We're turned to the book of Habakkuk. Trust there's no Americans here. They talk about Habakkuk, but um, we, we'll just use the, the Englified pronunciation. Uh, it's Habakkuk. And you, if you turn in your New Testament and go to Matthew and then work your way back, uh, you will eventually come to Habakkuk. That's probably the easiest way to uh, find it. Um, we're going to read from chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 1. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And we're reading, of course, from the authorized version. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, we read, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked does compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen in regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the lepers and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteneth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over, and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of pure eyes, and behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he, and makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net, and burn incense unto their drag, because by them their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net, and not spare continually to slay the nations? Amen. We know the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of his own infallible and inerrant Word. This morning, I am continuing our series of messages, a brief series of messages, on the subject, the holiness of God. And my text is taken from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 12, right through to verse 13. And my theme today is the absolute holiness of God seen in the awful heinousness of man's sin. So I've told you the text, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. You can read it as you look at it. And think of this theme, the absolute holiness of God, 
seen in the awful heinousness of man's sin. Now, if you look and read Habakkuk chapter 1 very carefully, you will discover three major things in the chapter. I want you to think of the argument that he expresses. If you look at chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? You see, Habakkuk the prophet, his heart and mind at this time is totally perplexed. He is baffled. He is wrestling with a particular conundrum regarding God's treatment of his own people. You see, God's people had fallen in deep sin and an apostasy from God as the living and the true God. A whole generation had grown up who had turned away from the Lord. The Lord was deliberately forsaken. The Lord was deliberately forgotten. His divine law was broken. His worship was abandoned and largely ignored. People had turned to a life of idolatry. They were worshipping idols of stone and, and, and wood and, and, and uh, had, had turned to Baal and to Molech and to Mammon. And they, they had given themselves over to immorality, really vile immorality. And of course, the land was full of iniquity. He mentions in this chapter violence. And violence, of course, has to do with bloodshed. There were some saying in Israel at this time, well, it's no big deal. This is an age of enlightenment. God's people have come of age. Surely the people are free to do their own thing. It's, it's their choice. Habakkuk, the prophet, he's ministering to the people and he's saying, no, this is a recipe for disaster. This will bring the judgment of God upon your head. Now listen to him praying to the Lord. It says in verse 2, look at your book. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. You see, he's praying to the Lord about this situation. He's thinking about life in the land in his day. And he's asking the Lord to intervene. And he can't understand why the Lord hasn't intervened in grace and mercy, but why the Lord hasn't sent revival blessing. And he's saying, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence. And thou will not see if you haven't come to bring about deliverance. Look at verses 3 and 4. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Look at verse 4. Here's a consequence of this idolatry, this immorality, this iniquity. Therefore the law is slacked. See, it affects the government of the day. And judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked does come pass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Now after some time, and we don't know how long, God answered Habakkuk the prophet. And that answer is from verse 5 right down to verse 11. And notice what he says in verse 5. Behold, he among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. So here's God, and he does answer the prophet. And what does he say? I am not going to restore Israel at this time. I, I am not going to directly intervene in revival blessing. I am going to raise up the Chaldeans, 
that wicked, dreadful people and bring them into the land of Israel and punish and chastise my people. I'm going to cause the Chaldeans to come and I'm going to allow them to deal terribly with my people and I'm going to use them to chastise and afflict my people to bring upon them my judgment and thy wrath. Now Habakkuk, he could not understand why God was going to do this. And then he begins to talk then in verse 12 and 13 and on to the end and make an argument to the Lord that they are pagans, that they are grossly immoral people themselves. Lord, they don't know you. They, they are wicked people. They do terrible things to women and babies. Yes, Lord, I acknowledge that your people in Israel have sinned. But Lord, they're definitely not as bad as the Chaldeans. Why use them? You see, his heart and his mind is perplexed. He's totally overwhelmed. He just can't take it in. He, he, he can't understand it. So notice he turns to God in prayer. Verses 12 and 13 in particular. And notice what he says. Thou art, what? Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? Now, 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 now think of that. What's he saying there? Art thou not from everlasting? He's thinking of the eternality of God. He, he, he says, O Lord, he's thinking of God's sovereignty and his relationship to trust in that sovereign God. O Lord, my God. And then notice he adds this, mine holy one. He's thinking of the holiness of God. In the argument that he expresses, he's thinking of the holiness of God. Now, now let's go to the second thing that he thinks about in this chapter, the second thing that's mentioned. I want you to think of the attribute that he begins to expound. You remember, he's praying to God. And he's saying to the Lord, Lord, you're a holy God. Lord, you are essentially, you are eternally, you are exclusively, you are holy. Lord, how could you use these terrible, wicked sinners, given that you're mine holy one? How could you be indifferent to their sin in this way? The prophet is arguing with God from the attribute of God's holiness. And he tells the Lord, Thou art of purer eyes and behold evil and canst not look in iniquity. Wherefore, in other words, how could you use the Chaldeans to punish the children of Israel for their sin against you? Yet they are bigger sinners themselves. I want you to remember that this is exactly what God has told the prophet he's going to do. Let's remember that the Lord is an absolute sovereign control of time and history and every creature. And he did use the Chaldeans to punish the children of Israel. The Chaldeans is another name for the Babylonians. I told you last Sunday night that three times they came to the land of Israel to destroy it. 605 BC, 597 BC and 586 BC. And then God told Habakkuk that he was going to deal and destroy the Babylonians. Remember what he read, or it says in verse 11, Then shall his mind change, that's the Babylonians, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this as power unto his God. So, so all the military conquests of the Babylonians were attributed to their God. And they were full of pride. And then, of course, the Lord eventually brought them down. And the Lord said, after that time, then he would turn in grace and mercy and deal again with the children of Israel. And in the process, he's saying to Habakkuk, I want you to trust me. 
that I'm in absolute sovereign control, that I'm on the throne, that I'm in charge, that I have foreordained to bring to pass the counsel of my holy will and purpose. I'm working to a master plan in dealing with the nations of the world. We are thinking of the holiness of God. And where's the holiness of God seen? I've already told you it's seen in his works, creation. God is holy in all his works, in his providence. You see, God often displays his anger with man's sin in acts of judgment. You think of Noah's day and the universal flood. The old world was destroyed, only eight were saved by the ark. Think of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the uh, plain. God rained fire and brimstone down and destroyed them. Only Lot was saved out of Sodom. Think of our day. Hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, diseases. Think about the disease called AIDS. Even think today very seriously of this coronavirus sweeping the world. 100,000 people affected so far. Could we not also say that this too is a judgment from God? Because God's in absolute sovereign control. But we believe, of course, that his holiness is seen especially in redemption. See, the doctrine of redemption shows forth the holiness and justice of God's character. God is so perfectly holy that he cannot and would not just forgive sin. Sin has to be paid for, for the wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us. See, God's holy uh, law, his holy justice, had to be perfectly satisfied. You think of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Remember his cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Think of Christ hanging on the accursed tree, the horrible death of crucifixion, suffering the wrath of God, the Lord Jesus being made sin for us. And in that very act, which was the climax of his obedience to the Father's will and the Father's mind. Remember on the cross, when God was making his soul an offering for sin, what did God the Father do? He turned away his face from God the Son. And we get asked the question, how could God the Father abandon his Son? How could God the Father pour out upon his Son all the fury of his wrath? How how could his Son suffer the holy judgment of God for sin? And here's the answer this morning. The very holiness of God demanded it. It was, it was, and is the holy character of God as God that unleashed the fury of his justice and wrath upon Christ and the cross. See, God is glorious in holiness this morning. Holiness is the very essence of God's glory. Holiness is not just a, another attribute or one of his attributes, like omnipresence or, or omnipotence. I, I believe this morning that holiness is the very essence of God's being. And all of God's attributes, natural and moral, they are holy. Every attribute is essentially and, and entirely and internally and exclusively holy. See, when I think about holiness... Many commentators have attempted to define it, moral purity and moral perfection. It is that, but it's more. Holiness is the very essence of God. God is holy. Now now think of that. The very essentiality and the nature of this self-existent, transcendent being that we call God, this God is holy. It's what sets God apart from all his creatures in the whole of the universe. He is infinitely holy, eternally holy. He's unchangeably holy in his being and every other aspect. Holiness has to do with the very nature of God. And only God is essentially holy. He says, Habakkuk, mine holy one. See, God's holiness and God's nature are not two different things. They are one. All that God is is holy. As I've said repeatedly, and I want you to grasp it, and I've deliberately said it, God is essentially and eternally and entirely holy. Boys and girls this morning, listen to me for just a few minutes. 
God is not an indulgent old man up in heaven who has no personal sin in himself but winks at sin and tolerates sin in the lives of others. See, people believe that God is an indulgent old man up in heaven who has no personal sin, but he's so tolerant of sin that he compromises his holy justice, his holy righteousness, his holy truth, his holy law. But he doesn't. God has a knowledge of sin. God hates sin. God punishes sin. God, of course, pardons sin through Christ. And it's all because God is holy. Here's Habakkuk the prophet. Look at verse 13, and I'll wrap this up in a few minutes. Thou art of pure eyes, and behold evil, and canst not look in iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and withholdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. See, here's the prophet, and he's thinking of God's holiness. He's thinking that God is holy. And he's so holy that he cannot look on sin. He can't look on sin with approval and blessing. So as we think of this chapter, there's an argument that he expresses about God using the Chaldeans to punish the children of Israel. We think about the attribute that he expounds, mine holy one. And let's think about the attitude that he explains as we finish. Look at verse 13. Thou art of pure eyes, and behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Let me tell you three things as we finish. God's knowledge of man's sin. See, God is not an indulgent old man upstairs in heaven. God is not oblivious to all that's going on in the world. He's not foolish. He's not naive. He hasn't shut up his eyes to all that is going on in the world. I believe that God is fully aware of man's sin every sin. And in Habakkuk's day, there was two nations, the Chaldeans, and there was the uh, children of Israel, two wicked, sinful people, apart from the grace of God, one more wicked than the other. But God has full knowledge of every sin that every creature was committing in that day in thought, in word, and deed. And even though the prophet said, Thou art of pure eyes, and behold evil, and canst not look at iniquity, it doesn't mean, young people, that God doesn't see, or have a knowledge of, or is aware of the iniquity. He is fully aware of every sin, of every creature. Nothing is hidden to his all-seeing and his all-knowing eye. The God of the Bible has perfect knowledge of all sin and all evil on the earth. And that includes we Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, the United States of America, Europe, Australia, Africa, Russia. There's not one sin going to escape or has escaped God's holy gaze. The eyes of God is on all men, all day, every day, and in every place. Human beings, of course, do things under the cover of darkness. Some men cover their face with a balaclava and have gone out in the past and murdered other men in cold-blooded murder. They might have disguised and covered up their crimes, but the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Let me tell you a little story. A boy and a girl, and they're in a house. Mummy and Daddy's there. And the wee girl gets a lovely doll for Christmas. It's called a corn doll. I don't think we have them here in Northern Ireland, but this was a corn doll. It was made out of cloth, but the inside had got corn seeds in it. And of course, the wee boy, he hated this doll. And he thought, I'm going to play a prank in my sister. So what he did was, he took the doll, when she wasn't there, he dug a hole in the garden, and he buried it. And she couldn't find her doll. She went to sleep with it every night. And she cried and cried, where's my doll? Where's my doll, mummy? Where's my doll? And of course they asked the wee brother, did you see Sarah's doll? I I never seen it. Maybe the dog took it, carried it away somewhere. That's probably what happened. The dog probably chewed it. So a long time passed, boys and girls. Months passed. She never had the doll. And then one day, they were all out in the garden playing. And down at the bottom of the garden, we was looking, and she called the daddy over. Come, do you see this, Joan? Well, what is it? It was the outline of the doll. 
the corn seeds had begun to grow up through the cloth and they could see the outline of the doll in the ground. And when they dug it up, they found the buried doll in the garden. Be sure your sin will find you out. And sin can be covered up for years, but then it will find you out. But, but even what that little boy did, it didn't escape the all-seeing, all-searching eye of God. Hagar said, Thou God sees me. God has perfect knowledge of me. You see, in the psalmist's day, uh, in Psalm 94, verses 3 to 9, uh, there was people saying that the Lord didn't see. And neither does the Lord regard what we do. They were thinking that they could deceive God, which was impossible. Because God sees the depravity of your sin. God sees the very depth of your sin. Sin remembers not just an outward action, but sin's a thought of the heart and the mind. Genesis 6 and 5, God saw the wickedness of man. That their sinful imaginations of their heart was evil continually. And in that day, the whole earth was full of violence. God saw the very conception of sin in their mind. When, when it was formed in their mind as a thought, as a lust, as a craving. When, when it was a, a, a rebellious stirring of their heart. It didn't escape it. See, God knows our private sins, our public sins, our lust, our wicked thoughts, our impure cravings. God knows the very motives and the corrupt reasons and the sinful passions of our heart. The heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Who can know it? And of course, God is the one who searches the heart. Sins of childhood, sins of school, teenage years, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, every detail. God has a knowledge of man's sin. And I just want to say this. And I say it very respectfully. God has a knowledge of your sin this morning. Even sins that are past. Sins that are covered up. Sins that nobody knows about. Like the little doll. And God has a way of bringing that out into the open. But even if it doesn't come out in the open, God has still a knowledge of it. Very quickly, God's hatred of man's sin. Now, turn over there to, to Psalm 5 and look with me at, at verse 5. Psalm 5 and verse 5. Notice what it says there. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. In Psalm 7 and verse 11 it says, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. And over there in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3 and in the verse um, 32 um, we read the words, for the froward is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. For the froward, that's a forward person, a person who pushes himself to the front. And, and, and listen again to the book of Proverbs in Proverbs 15 and verse 26. This is a, a scripture that I've often thought about. It, it says, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Do you know it's an abomination to kings to commit wickedness? For the throne is established by righteousness. You see, when we examine the scriptures, young people, God can't look upon sin without loathing it. God can't look upon sin without hating sin, without that sin arousing his wrath and anger. Because remember, God is eternally, essentially, and entirely holy. See, many dismiss the idea of sin today. Many dismiss the idea of God. Many, of course, can't think of God's hatred for sin and his hatred of the sinner. 
And you can't separate God's hatred of sin from his hatred of the sinner. Man is his view of sin. They laugh at it. It's no big deal. They break the Sabbath day. Uh, they, they don't love God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. They lie. They steal. They covet. You, you think of the sins of our day, whether it's premarital sex or whether it's adultery or whether it's a homosexuality. Uh, you think of dishonesty and jealousy and bitterness and envy. Think of murder and, uh, and, 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 and theft. Hasn't the film industry made sin look attractive, look appealing? They view it as normal. It's, it's all part of life. But God hates sin. God cannot approve of sin. God cannot excuse sin. God will not promote sin. He will not make light of sin. God is angry with the wicked every day. God hates sin. He won't have sin in his presence because sin is contrary to his holy nature. Sin is not just disagreeable to God. Sin is disgusting to God. Sin is not just hateful to God. Sin is heinous to God. And it's God who defines what sin is. Sin remembers the transgression of the law, the shorter catechism. What is sin? Sin is anyone to conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Sin is breaking the holy law of God. And God's law is holy. To him that knoweth to do good and to do it or not, to him it is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. See, the Bible teaches that unbelief is a sin. Because sin is against God. It's anti-God, it's anti-Scripture, it's contrary to God's purpose. It flies in the face of all that God is, and God can't condone it. He won't endorse it. Every sin, public, private, particular, sins of thought, sins of the hands, sins of the eye, sins of the mouth, sins of the feet, every sin, it's, it's all against God. Now listen to this as we finish. God's action of man's sin. If you go back to our text and think of the argument that the prophet has expressed and the attribute that he expounds, and here's the attitude that he is setting before us, God's attitude to sin, an attitude that he's explaining. God is a knowledge of sin. God is a hatred of sin. But here's God's action to sin. God brought the wicked Chaldeans into the land of Judah, and sent that land into captivity all because of their sin. See, nothing satisfies the holiness of God until sin is punished. And punished in full. And God ordained the children of Judah for judgment. And God established the Chaldeans to bring about correction in Judah. All because God is absolutely holy. See, a holy God must deal with sin. For the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. So if you think of that, God must deal with sin, then how does he deal it? God has dealt with sin, first of all, in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And we, we think of Christ bearing the guilt and punishment of our sin. And the Bible tells us, he that believeth in him is not condemned. And, and that's a tremendous uh, truth that, that you should grasp hold of this morning. Remember, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I asked this morning, if Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God, suffered it on the tree, then have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Remember the Bible says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You can be saved this morning if you recognize your sin, repent of it, and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in that great day of wrath, you'll be found in Christ and trusting in him. You'll be saved and spared from that wrath. That's why Christ came. That's why Christ was born. That's why Christ had to be sinless. That's why Christ died and shed his blood on the cross. Because on the cross, Christ endured the wrath of God. And God's holiness is best seen at the cross of Christ. And we thought about that last week. Psalm 22, verse 3. And, and in Christ, you can have a full and free and forever pardon. See, God, holiness was satisfied when sin was punished through the death of Jesus Christ and his bodily resurrection. But I want to tell you this, that for every unrepentant soul, there's a day of judgment coming. We'll stand before God, the books will be opened, then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And you think of that day, 
when God will say to men and women, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And that day is coming. You should think about that day and live in light of that day. And think of God's action of man's sin. If God raised up the Chaldeans to bring punishment to Judah, then God not only knows sin and hates sin, but God acts to deal with sin. And then, of course, come to the cross. Not only providential judgment, but but terrible punishment for sin in the face of Christ, one who was sinless and one who was holy. And then, of course, a terrible day of wrath that's coming for everyone that knows not God and obeys not the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Here's the absolute holiness of God seen in the awful heinousness of man's sin. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this morning. We're going to